Good morning. OK, so as I mentioned last time, you've got uh, two back-to-back -back assignments that are going to be due next week. And the situation with this, the, there used to just be one assignment for Chapter 5, but I split it up into pieces. Don't be thrown off by the fact that it seems like there's a lot of numbers here. Uh, the main idea in Chapter 5 is so simple that uh, rather than depth of difficulty, there's more uh, breadth of application in these problems. And so I think that you'll find each one of them is relatively straightforward. So I'd encourage you to get an early start on these uh, just while it's fresh in your mind and in case any questions come up. We're going to continue talking about the continuity relationship and uh, one specialized application of that today. So uh, any announcement questions before we get into the new material? All right. Well, let's review what we looked at last time. We had a tank. And when we looked at this tank, we were discussing the system. And the system, as you recall, was the dark blue fluid. And uh, what made the system different from the fluid particles that wasn't the system? Well, it's maybe uh, what's uh, before and after is also water. It's just we're interested in a certain amount of water. And that's what we call the system. And it's continuously connected. And so what we did was we drew control surfaces, which is the outside boundary that encloses a control volume. And the reason why we did that was we wanted to play an accounting game. We wanted to keep track of what comes in and what goes out through the control surfaces. And what we said was that the difference between the inflow and the outflow results in an accumulation within the control volume. So this expression is an extension of that. And let me talk you through how to interpret this. It's saying that the change of mass of the system over time is related to uh, the change over time inside of the control volume, where here this is density, and then dV is talking about the change in volume. The V with the cross through it is volume, whereas the V here is talking about velocity. And so the second term is saying flow through the control surfaces. Cs is control surface. And so density times V times dA, where dA is some differential area. Last time in class, we had the expression that Q equals VA. And so essentially, this is the same thing in the second term here. It's saying uh, velocity times area, which gives us Q. And then if we multiply Q by the density of the fluid, that's the mass flow rate. That's what we were using as M dot during the examples last time. Okay, so what this is saying is the mass of the system is the difference between the mass flow in and out through the control surfaces and then whether or not there's any sort of a reaction inside of the control volume. Uh, sometimes mass, if it depends on what, what uh, constituent we're keep, keeping track of, there may be a reaction inside of the control volume. And so, uh, for instance, if we have wastewater treatment, there's a wastewater treatment plant here uh, close to campus, as a matter of fact. And what it does is it takes all of the wastewater from the University City area and bacteria break down some of the pollutants. And so inside of a big tank where wastewater is being treated, maybe the mass that we would be focusing on and we'd be doing our calculations of is the pollution in the water. And so inside of the tank, which is called a reactor, there would be a breakdown of those pollutants. And so the mass would be decreasing because of a reaction. But then also, we'd need to keep track of the flow in of the mass into that tank and the flow out of the mass of the pollutants out of the tank. Did you have a question? CS is the outside area that encompasses the control volume. And so uh, this tank, you'll notice, has the dashed line around it. So the dashed line is the control surface. And uh, it's the outer layer that's inside of that is the control volume. And so uh, the reason why we distinguish between the two is that it's the control surface, actually, that's sort of our boundary for determining whether there's flow in and out in terms of transport. And then on the inside of that is where we keep track of storage. And you'll notice that I've, I've broken this equation up into two pieces, the storage component and the transport component. 
And this is an important conceptual idea. What it says is that the difference between the mass that's accumulating inside of the storage area, it's a function of whatever reaction is happening, and then the flow in and the flow out of whatever mass we're keeping track of. So, you know, maybe it's a chemical reaction, and that tank that we're putting our boundary around is some sort of a reactor where uh, a chemical is being produced. And so it could be a production reaction. It could be a consumption reaction if it's an environmental pollutant being broken down. Um, what we were talking about, though, we were just mainly discussing water flow. And so there doesn't necessarily have to be a reaction inside of the tank. It might be the case that the mass of the system isn't changing. And so dm dt can be zero if there's no reaction inside of the control volume. And if there's no reaction inside of the control volume, then the, uh, the change in mass over time depends only on the flow in versus the flow out. So if there is a reaction, then we have to, uh, we have to keep track of the rate of the reaction versus the rate in and the rate out. So here is what these variables mean. Uh, M, we're talking about the mass or some property that's related to the mass. Uh, T, time, density, V with the cross through it, volume, velocity, area. Um, so this Reynolds transport theorem, the three components are on the left side here, the change of mass inside of the system that can be reaction related, the storage and how it changes over time, and then the flow in and the flow out over the uh, control surfaces. And so there is a time component here with the velocity. So since velocity has units of, of length per time, then each one of these terms is going to have some sort of a time component to it. Uh, this is the change in mass over time because of the dt here. And this is the change in mass over time because there is a uh, time in the denominator of the velocity term. Okay, so this is where we were on the previous slide. This is Reynolds transport theorem. Let's say that we don't have a reaction happening. It's a conservative material or just for whatever reason the mass isn't being created or destroyed inside of the control volume. Well, in that case, we can simplify Reynolds transport theorem. So uh, all I've done here is I've just put a zero where we previously had dm dt. And so now we have the same two terms. There is the, uh, there's the transport and the storage term. So here's the storage term. And what this is breaking down to, it's the rate of accumulation of mass in the control volume. And if you have no reaction, then it's the accumulation is just because of the flow in versus the flow out. And so I wrote it most simply previous class as accumulation is in minus out. And uh, this is the fancy way of saying accumulation is in minus out. In minus out is the transport term, net mass efflux. That means the net flow out of our control surface boundary. And then this is our storage term, where we're talking about a change of volume. Multiplied by the density means a change of mass inside of the control volume. So another way of writing that is here. The change of mass inside the control volume over time is the difference between the mass flow in and the mass flow out. And so you know, chapter five is just easy ideas. It's very simple concepts that happen to be quite powerful. One of, the, uh, one of the ways that we apply the Reynolds transport theorem comes back to the question of how do you find the pressure at a certain location in a flow field? Um, so let's take, for instance, flow at a contracting section. The pipe diameter is getting narrower. And so what we know is the velocity increases. And what did Bernoulli's equation tell us about uh, how the pressure changes? When the velocity goes up, the pressure goes down, right? Because the sum of the three components, the elevation head, the velocity head, and the pressure head, the sum of those three components has to be equal between two points if we assume that there's no energy loss between them. So here, 
what we did uh, in a Lagrangian approach, you can integrate Euler's equation as the particle moves from A to B. Now, Euler's equation was the one that's talking about local acceleration. But, you know, it takes time for the particle to go from A to B. So if we looked at the change in position over time, then we'd know a change in velocity. So we can use Euler's equation to tell us the change in pressure as the particle goes from A to B. It would probably be more natural, though, for us just to apply Bernoulli's equation. Uh, remember, the assumptions for Bernoulli's equation includes the stipulation that the flow has to be steady, meaning that conditions are constant over time. So that's how we could find the pressure at B. But the problem with the Lagrangian approach is just um, keeping track of all the path lines because there are so many particles um, that, especially if the flow is unsteady, if the flow is changing over time, then it's difficult just to track all of the particles. Uh, and so our simplifying procedure, as discussed earlier, is this Eulerian approach of make a mesh in other words, you divide the flow area up into small elements, and then you find out what is the average flow in one of those elements, and then you assign all of the particles inside of the control volume a single velocity. And you just say that you're going to let the average velocity inside that window represent the full conditions in there. Uh, so. This is a solution that tells you the flow properties at any point because every, every, point has the, every point within the element has the same characteristics. And so you apply a free body approach to many elements and then you can keep track of the pressure and shear stress. Um, so the control volume is an imaginary construct. It's just these boundaries that we arbitrarily set, but you can apply the idea of control volumes to more than just finding the mass flow rate. You can apply the control volume approach to finding out how the pressure changes. And this is you know, in the software that's used these days for uh, modeling flow environments like through um, medical devices or uh, flow through um, in chemical plants and in drinking water plants. They use the sophisticated software that basically divides the flow field up into small areas like this. So that's one of the approaches. Well, let's get practical. Uh, we have an example here where there's a tank of water. And uh, you can see the dashed line here represents our control surface. On the inside of the control surface is our control volume. And there happens to be a place where liquid can accumulate inside the control volume. So we do have a potential for storage because of that tank. You can see that there is one stream of, uh, of water flowing in. And the way that they've described the rate of the inflow is with a cross-sectional area. And that's just talking about the cross-sectional area of the jet as it goes towards the tank. And then the velocity at that same location that the area is measured, 7 meters per second. So that tells us the flow in. The flow out is just given directly in volumetric terms. And then one last piece of information we have is the diameter of the tank. This is a circular tank that we're looking at. It has a diameter of 0.5 meters. Okay, so what we're interested to know is how quickly is the liquid level rising or falling? In other words, the velocity of the water surface. And if you've ever filled a swimming pool with a hose before, you know that the water level rises so slowly. You know, it takes hours and hours to fill a swimming pool. So, uh, this is the same kind of idea. We've got a flow coming in, but in this case, there's also a flow going out. And we want to know what's the velocity going up or going down. And the key to this is applying the mass balance approach. You look at the flow in, you look at the flow out, and then that's going to tell us the rate of accumulation. So I'm going to stop talking, pause the recording, and give you some time to consider this example. The key here is that we know the diameter of the tank. Once you know the rate of mass accumulation, then using the diameter of the tank will tell you how quickly the liquid level is going up. And just to stimulate your thinking, let me ask one conceptual question. What if it's a small tank with a small diameter? Would the liquid level go up faster than if it's a big tank? 
of course. You know, the swimming pool, the reason why the liquid level rises slowly is because it has such a big surface area. But a bathtub fills a lot faster than a swimming pool because the surface area of the bathtub is lower. All right. Let's see if everybody's on the right track. Okay, so the first thing that you do is uh, find the flow in. And we find the flow in because it's given to us uh, the velocity in is 7 meters per second. And we know the cross-sectional area of this jet of water as it comes in. So here's the flow rate in in volumetric terms. Here's the flow in in mass flow terms, kilograms per second. We can do the same thing with the flow out. In fact, it's even easier. We're given the Q, so to find the mass flow rate, we just have to multiply it by the liquid, uh, the liquid density, which is 1,000 kilograms per cubic meter. So if you've got 17 kilograms per second coming in and only three going out, then obviously water is accumulating inside of the tank. And so that tells us that the liquid level is going up. So here I found the difference between the two, and I conclude that the fluid level in the tank is rising because DMCV DT is positive. So there's more water coming in than out, so that water has to go somewhere. The liquid level accumulates. So the next step, you can see over on the whiteboard there, I drew the tank to give you the hint of how you find the velocity of the water level rising. If you know the, the net volumetric flow rate, meaning the, uh, the flow rate of accumulation and divide it by the area of the tank, then that'll tell you the velocity that the water level is rising. So a big area, if you have a really large tank area, then that would mean the velocity is low because the tank area is in the denominator. If you have a small tank area, like from a small diameter tank, then that's going to give you a larger velocity. So that just sort of matches what conceptually we know. And uh, let's take a look at the calculation. So the rate of rise, we have the, uh, the Q of accumulation is 0 0.0145 cubic meters per second. And then I find the velocity that the water level is rising by having that net flow rate, the accumulation flow rate, divided by the tank area. So it's going up uh, 0.0738 meters per second. So about 7.4 centimeters per second is how quickly the liquid level is rising. So quizzes and exams, um, you know, there's like an infinite number of problems that can be put together when you just think about you have one stream coming in and two streams coming out, or you just put together combinations of, uh, of different number of pipes in and out, and you try and find out how the liquid level is responding to that. And this is very typical of the sorts of problems that you can expect to see for uh, chapter five. Any questions related to the example? Sure. The yep, the last step? Yeah, the last step. Mm -hmm. All right, so what we know is that there's more water coming into the tank than going out. And so logically, that means the liquid level has to be rising. But we want to know how fast is it going up. So the velocity that it's going up. And um, we know the general continuity equation is Q equals VA. And so it's the same application here. It's just instead of talking about a pipe in and a pipe out, now we're treating this tank as the Q equals VA. And so the Q is the difference between the in and the out. And the A is the cross-sectional area of the tank. And so if we just rearrange this general continuity equation, V equals Q divided by A will tell us how quickly the liquid level is rising. And so what that means is if you have like a swimming pool, a very large cross-sectional area at the surface, a big denominator is going to make the velocity small. Um, or a small denominator, if you have a really narrow tank, then the liquid level would have been rising faster if, if we had maybe a 0.1 meter diameter instead of the 0.5 that was described in the problem statement. All right. So here's another one. And 
And uh, this is uh, an example that is talking again about uh, control volume. It's the tank. And these pistons are sliding. They're both sliding to the left. So piston A is sliding to the left at 2V, double the velocity that piston B is sliding to the left. And what you notice <coughs> is that they have uh, two different diameters. Piston A has a diameter of three centimeters, and piston B has a diameter of six. And so just to summarize, we've got this one is going at V, this is going at 2V, but piston B has a diameter that's double piston A. And so let me ask you, what happens to the water level in this case? Uh, I guess there's three possibilities. The water level is either going down, it's staying constant, or the water level is going up. So who thinks that the water level is going down, that actually the liquid level is declining in the tank? I don't see any hands for that one. How about the, the water level is holding steady? Any votes for that? All right. Who thinks the water level is going up? All right, pretty evenly split. It turns out this is a trick question, guys. It seems like it would be steady, right? Because you've got two V and V, but this is double the diameter compared to that. But who can explain the trick behind this trick question? Right. Exactly. So remember, the, the trick is that uh, uh, Q equals V times A. And uh, A is pi D squared divided by 4. And so when we double the diameter, that's actually four times the area compared to piston A. And so piston B has four times the area. And so even though it's moving at half the speed, the velocity is only V instead of 2V, it's still going to be pushing more water into the tank than piston A is sucking water out of the tank. So more water is coming in than going out. So we know that the liquid level is going to be increasing. And let's take a look at a proof of that. All right. So what I did in this example is I calculated the area at A and the area at B. Since we have both the diameters, we can calculate the cross-sectional areas. And so even though we don't know the velocity in absolute terms, we can do this problem in, in terms of the variable V, you know, whatever that unknown velocity is. We're just going to call it V. So the flow in, in volumetric terms, it's going to be the velocity in, which is this V to the left. It's pushing water inside of our control volume, multiplied by the area. So we're going to have mixed units here because the velocity, we don't know the units there, but it's just basically when we multiply the two terms together, 28.274 V is the flow in. The flow out is 2 V is the velocity. That's given in the problem statement. But then the area that we calculated is a quarter of this area because of the, uh, the fact that we square the diameters. So uh, the flow out is 14.138. So the difference between the two, if we find the, uh, the difference between the flow in and the flow out, now I've written this in mass terms. You can also do it in volumetric terms to know whether the water level is rising or falling. Um, since that's positive, that means that there is a net accumulation inside of the control volume. So the, the liquid level will be going up because there's more mass going in than going out. I love, I love that trick question because uh, it always splits the class right down the middle. Um, just your first instinct is to see that You've got double the diameter, but half the velocity, so you think, oh, it's got to even out. But then there's that pesky little squared that you've got to remember. Any questions about this trick question? Who knows, maybe you'll see a trick question like this again.
we've got exam two coming up in a few weeks and the final exam a few weeks after that. All right. All right, this is the last one I want to, uh, to show you. And I'm actually going to, we've got plenty of time to work on this, which is a good one, because uh, this is a really interesting uh, example. This is the second time this semester we've seen a cylinder falling down through a pipe. The first one was when we were talking about shear stress and fluid viscosity. This is a little bit different. There's more space between the pipe and the cylinder on this one. So we've got 150 millimeter diameter metal cylinder and it's falling down at one meter per second. As it falls down, you have to think about what's happening to the liquid that's in the path of the cylinder. The liquid that's in the path of the cylinder is getting pushed around the edge. So it falls down and it's displacing the fluid that's in front of it. Um, and so the, the water can't go through the solid, it has to go around the solid as it falls. And so as it falls, it's entering a control volume and it's displacing water around the edges. And so the, uh, the dimensions are given that the diameter of the cylinder is 150, the diameter of the pipe is 200, and what I'd like you to calculate, it says here is the mean velocity of the water in the space between the cylinder and the tube wall. So here's the tube, here's the cylinder. I want to know the water velocity as it flows around the side of that cylinder. All right, I'm not going to give you too many hints on this because I want you to, uh, to go through that jump yourself and then we'll take a look at the solutions. Of course, as always, feel free to collaborate. I'm going to be circulating around with the solution to see uh, if you're on the right track. On my solution, it's as much text as calculations. I, I wrote out a bunch of words just to uh, kind of remind myself of the concepts here. So we've got the same cylinder that's falling down through a pipe. And then you can see that I, I ended up drawing the control surfaces just so that in my mind I could conceive of where is the water going. So here is my control volume. And what I'm saying is the cylinder enters the control volume and it displaces the water. As that solid cylinder comes into the control volume, then there has to be a flow out around the edges because of it. You know, water can't be compressed, so it has to go somewhere. It goes around the edge <coughs> of the cylinder. So here I've drawn my control surfaces and on the inside is the control volume. So if the cylinder falls down, it pushes the water around it. So calculation-wise, I find the, uh, the flow in. And this is kind of a, an interesting thing because it's a solid substance. It's a cylinder. And so when I say flow in, that has maybe a strange idea to it because usually when we're calculating flow rates, we're thinking it in terms of a liquid. Um, but anyway, it has a, a cross-sectional area that relates to the uh, diameter and it has a fall velocity that's given of one meter per second. And so uh, we can think that this is the, the rate of volume entering the control, uh, of, of the cylinder volume entering the control volume. So the cylinder is going into this imaginary control volume at a rate of 0 0.0176 cubic meters per second. And so it, that's the rate that it'll be pushing the liquid out. There's no place inside of this control volume that water or any other volume can accumulate and so in is equal to out. I was walking around and I, I think everyone that I saw working on the calculations had already picked up on this Q in equals Q out idea and that's a big one so I was glad to see that. So that tells us the Q out, the Q out is the same as the Q in and so the velocity out is going to be the Q out divided by the area. But the area now, here's the trick, is that we have to find the net area between the outside ring and the inside ring. Because the water is flowing out around the edge. You see back here in this drawing, I showed that the water is only going around the edge of the cylinder. It's not going through the cylinder. So that's where here I found the net difference between the two, the outer ring and the inside ring gives me a flow area of 0 0.0137 square meters 
So the velocity is going up around the outside. The average velocity is 1.29 meters per second. Any questions about that example? Okay. Yes? It's because if we look at the, uh, the control volume, it's already full of water. It's not like an empty tank where the liquid level could go up or go down. So since this control volume is already full of water, if the cylinder comes in, it has to push some of the water out. So the, specifically, what I'd say, like the most focused statement why in, Q in equals Q out is because there's no room for storage. There's no place that water can accumulate on the inside of the pipe. Good question. Are there any other questions? Okay. Uh, when we get to class on Sunday of next week, we're going to be talking about tanks like this that have a jet of water going out. So I wanted to show you something on the whiteboard here. Since we've got a couple of extra minutes today, this is something that uh, would be worth putting into your notes because it's going to show you a jet of water, how you find the velocity of a jet of water when there's a hole in the tank. So here we've got a hole in the tank and water is coming out because there's a hole in the tank. Now what we can do is we can pick two points and we're going to apply Bernoulli's equation between those two points to see what it tells us. So point number one is at the top of the tank. And what do we know, for example, about the, uh, uh, the pressure of water at location one? Okay, that's right. So P1 is zero because it's at the interface of the air and the water. I put my little triangle and the ripple marks to show that it's open to the air there. So P1 is zero. Now what about this jet of water? Once the water comes out of the tank, I mean here when it's in the tank, there's water pressure. But then when it comes out of the tank, what do we know about the pressure at two? Also zero. So P2 is equal to zero because there's air all around that jet. And so on the inside of the jet, it's also zero pressure. Uh, what we're going to do is we're going to say, you know, there is a Z1 and there is a Z2, but we're going to call Z1 minus Z2, that is H. It, here is H. It's the depth of the water from 1 to 2. And so let's write Bernoulli's equation between those two points. P1 divided by gamma plus Z1 plus V1 squared divided by 2G is equal to P2 divided by gamma plus Z2 plus V2 squared divided by 2G. Okay, we already said that the pressure at 1 and the pressure at 2 are 0. Z1 minus Z2 is H, and so we're going to put H here on the left side. Now, let's assume that this tank is relatively big so that maybe the liquid level is going down, but it's not going down very fast. Um, so what we're going to do is we're going to say that V1 is essentially zero, that there's no velocity head at one, um, and that'll be a pretty good assumption unless this is a very small tank. But for a regular sized tank, the liquid level as this drains is going to be going down slow enough that we can neglect the velocity head at one. So all we're left with is Z1 minus Z2, which is H, and that's going to be equal to uh, V2 squared divided by 2G. So now if we rearrange this, 2GH is equal to V2 squared. So V2 is equal to the square root of 2GH. Is that something you've already seen in lab? All right. So you've done the jet experiment already? We had, uh, when I was Several semesters ago at, uh, at Marshall, the, the university I normally teach at, we don't have lab instructors. And so it's actually a professor that does the lab. And it was like a, a Friday afternoon. 
which in the U.S., that's before the weekend, Friday. And um, we had this lab in the afternoon, and it was very boring to be there on a Friday afternoon when everyone else has already started their weekend. The students didn't like being there on Friday afternoon. I liked it, but I liked it less than I would have if it was a different day and time. So we sometimes would goof off just to make things interesting. And one of the things we did was we took the uh, hydraulic bench that we had because our jet experiment would shoot a jet of water. Uh, we had a pump that would shoot water like this. And we knew the flow rate, and we knew the diameter of that, and so we could calculate the area, right? The pi d squared divided by 4. And so if you know q and you know a, then you can calculate v. It's q divided by a. So we had this situation where we know the velocity, and one of the students said, I think that jet of water could hit the ceiling because we were in a, a big lab area. It probably had maybe like 10 meter ceilings. And his roommate said, I don't think it can hit the ceiling. And so they actually went through and did the calculations using Bernoulli's equation. They said, well, let's see, we know V1. This is V1. We know the pressure of the jet is zero. And one of them went through and did the calculations and said, I think we can hit the ceiling with the jet. And I was so proud of them for using Bernoulli's equation to prove whether or not the water jet could hit the ceiling, I said, we got to do this. We have to prove science correct. So we took the lid off. Normally, there's a lid on top of the jet. We took the lid off. We turned on the pump. And sure enough, it hit the ceiling, just like Bernoulli's equation said. So I don't think that you were able to do that experiment necessarily. But uh, the orifice equation, which we'll continue to use when we get together next week, is uh, a slightly less fun example of that same principle. All right, have a good day. If you didn't already pick up your assignment, get that off the table. I'll see you on Sunday.